what you should see on the screen here, the program where we left off yesterday is not my program, but a program that's uh, provided as part of the lessons that are with the Spike Prime Kit. And this is uh, somebody's design for last season's crane mission. And uh, uh, to review what we I said yesterday, uh, it starts by positioning uh, an arm that's connected to D, and then uh, it moves forward for 40 centimeters uh, to the beginning of a black line. Then it has a very simple line following back and forth movement while looking for dark versus light following the left edge of the black stripe until it detects, uh, it has two light sensors. It's following the line with the left light sensor. When the right light sensor uh, connected to F uh, detects black, it stops and it uses its uh, lifter arm that's still connected to D to lift up and down to trigger the crane. Uh, yesterday, I wasn't prepared. Uh, I was only half prepared because I hadn't finished building the uh, robot and uh, positioning the crane, but I'm somewhat prepared today, so I'm going to switch to that uh, webcam and see if it works in the first or second try. Uh, so let me change cameras. Give me a second. And I can make that bigger by dropping the screen share. So do you see the robot? And uh, at the opposite end of the field, you see the crane. And so let's see what happens. So it got, got pretty close. Um, it moved out to the black line, followed the black line, and then when the right sensor saw the perpendicular black line, uh, it stopped and then lifted the arm and almost triggered the crane. So uh, that might have been primarily an aiming problem um, on my part, or maybe the program needs a, a tune-up, but uh, you can see that it probably got closer than it would have if it had been purely dead reckoned by following the black line uh, and then detecting the black line, it was able to position itself pretty precisely in front of the crane. And uh, I highly recommend that your teams uh, use sensors for navigating on the field so they can get uh, more reliable results, especially for the missions that are farther away from uh, base. But even, even the crane one, which is pretty close to base uh, last year, um, benefited from that. Any questions? Okay. So let's go to the slides. And uh, just for fun, I'll switch the webcam back. So today we're going to be talking about data. We touched on data last time because the sensors produce data. Uh, that's not the only way to use the sensors, but uh, it is a common way. They can, uh, some of them uh, can produce true false values and some uh, produce values. But now we're going to introduce the notion of variables, which are uh, highly useful in using the data and making good use of the data. We won't get as far into uh, uh, data as we might because we want to have time in this fairly short hour of also getting into my blocks. Um, so we got uh, quite a bit to cover. Ho hopefully I can keep your interest for the full hour. Uh, 
So when it comes to uh, Scratch and uh, the renditions of Scratch for the EV3 Classroom and Spike Prime, there are two types of data. Uh, there are variables, which uh, in computer science might be called uh, singletons. Um, each variable holds a single value. Um, and there are lists, which uh, might uh, are equivalent to what computer scientists might call one-dimensional arrays. A list is a collection of uh, single values uh, organized uh, uh, as a list and are referenced by uh, a number. So the first thing in the list is uh, and number one, number two is the second thing in the list, and uh, sometimes it's it's really uh, useful to be able to organize uh, a series of values in a list and then refer to them by an index. That'll be less common in uh, the way your uh, teams program the robots, but uh, that uh, power is available to them if they need it. So how do you create a variable? Um, the, uh, you go to the variable menu on the left side and you click on uh, make a variable. And uh, you can also, once you've got a variable, you can set it to a value and you can change it by a certain amount. Um, here, distance is an arbitrary name given to a memory location. Um, it hopefully uh, the program uses it to contain something like distance, but um, you could have called it X. Uh, it could be called Bletch, um, and, but descriptive names are, are highly encouraged because it makes it much easier to understand what the intention of the program. Descriptive names and variables together with good commenting uh, make it a lot easier to maintain and enhance the program. Uh, a variable, uh, because it contains a, a value, it um, can be placed in any oval uh, of any any block. Um, some of those blocks you may start out using constant values like zero or one, um, but a variable can uh, can be put in the place of that constant value, and that block then will receive whatever the current value in that storage location is. Um, Variables are, are analogous to uh, algebraic variables, um, but they're more concrete um, in that they represent a storage location on uh, the microprocessor that's inside the robot hub. Um, so in binary, that storage location might be location 0112, excuse me, 00111, uh, 0110, but for convenience, uh, the programming language just allows us uh, to assign names to memory locations, and then we can store things in those memory locations uh, referred to as writing, and we get things back out of them referred to as reading. And as we use those variables, uh, our use of them in the programming language is similar to uh, uh, using variables in uh, equations and formulas and expressions. So let's uh, give an example. Um, let's say we know the distance that the robot wants to travel in inches or perhaps centimeters. Um, we know that uh, uh, we can refer to the width of the wheel as its diameter. Uh, perhaps we have a wheel that has a diameter of two and a quarter inches. Uh, we could have a variable called circum, short for circumference, uh, and we know that um, we can calculate circumference by multiplying diameter by pi. Um, and we know that if we want, if we have a wheel direct, connected directly to a motor, the number of rotations of that motor uh, can be uh, the desired number of rotations be be calculated by taking the distance in inches and dividing by the circumference of the wheel in inches or the distance in centimeters and dividing by the circumference of the wheel in centimeters. Either way, as long as uh, there's no gears changing the one-to-one -one nature of the motor to the turning of uh, the wheel, that will give you uh, 
the number of rotations it should take to, to go a certain distance. So how might you calculate that in a program? Um, well, let's review. A variable uh, is a container, has a name, has a type. Most common type of a variable would be a numeric value, two, five and a quarter, minus seven, but variables can also have the type logic uh, or Boolean, which would mean that they're gonna be either true or false. Um, and as I said, each variable can be written or read. Um, so uh, let's, to create a variable, you would click uh, on make a variable, and then it would give you a box and you would fill in the variable name. It, uh, the box comes up with a blank right here and uh, you can type anything you want. If you're trying to calculate speed, um, you could fill in speed and uh, then you would probably set that variable to a particular value, either a constant value or based on a formula. And then you would uh, use that variable uh, to plug into a block that uh, needed speed. And uh, you could have put the 50 directly into this block. So why would you use a variable in that case? Well, you, you might not. But if uh, the block setting the speed is in a variety of different places in your um, uh, 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 collection of stacks of blocks in a program, then setting a variable to a particular va value early in the program, uh, that variable then could be referenced in many places. And if the team decided they wanted a different speed, they wouldn't have to go and find all the places that speed was set. They could change the variable in one place. And as long as it was consistently, consistently referenced, it would affect all those places. Um, so in a simple example, it's hard to justify the variable, but in a more complex program, the variable can be quite powerful and convenient. So going back to the example of circumference uh, and distance, uh, here we set a, a distance variable to 10, a diameter variable to two and a quarter because uh, we've measured our wheels and we believe they're two and a quarter inches. Uh, we set another variable pi to 3.14157, and then we calculate uh, circumference, a uh, circumference variable is set to the value diameter times pi. And then in an actual uh, move block, we tell it to move straight um, and uh, we calculate, we do another calculation, the distance, which previously we had set to 10, divided by the circumference, which we just calculated, um, is the number of rotations, and we, and we specify rotations as the option we want for that move block. So there are other ways this could have been done. Uh, the entire calculation could have been done with a, a more complicated formula right in this move block. Um, that we could have created another variable uh, called rotations and, and set that variable to distance divided by circum, and then plugged in the rotations variable into this block um, uh, just like designing a robot has many different solutions, uh, designing the program has many different possible ways of doing it. Uh, there can be trade-offs between complexity and ease of uh, uh, maintenance and, and clarity of the program, um, et cetera. Any questions about this little example and how we're using variables? So let's look at another example. Uh, here we're uh, gonna use a variable as a zero or one value, uh, equivalent to a Boolean. Uh, zero will mean false and one will be tr mean true. Uh, we've created that variable uh, using that same menu item as we did before. And we set, uh, we named it stop loop and we set its initial value to zero. We uh, set the motor speed to a fixed 30%. We declare that our wheels are connected to the B and C ports. And we uh, say that the um, robot should start moving straight using the B and C motors. Um, 
And then we start a loop. We say loop until the uh, stop loop variable is equal one. Well, it's equal to zero. So this loop can execute at least once. And each time through the loop, uh, two things are being checked. Uh, first, uh, an if statement says, um, it, has the force sensor been pressed? Uh, the force sensor connected to A. If so, then uh, stop the robot from moving and set uh, the stop loop variable to one. If uh, the force sensor had not been pressed, we have another check we wanna do in the else clause. Uh, and so we say if, and we check the light sensor to see if it has a value that's less than 20, which would um, indicate a dark area on the map. If we've reached a dark area, again, we would stop the robot from moving and we would set the uh, stop loop variable to one. So if either of those happen in the first iteration, um, it would uh, it would hit, it would do this check here and, and see that stop loop was now one and it would leave the loop and it would play a beep sound for two seconds. Now there are other ways we could have constructed this. We could have moved this stop moving block to just before the beep and simply set the uh, stop loop variable to one, uh, relying on the fact that that would cause the loop to uh, terminate uh, within milliseconds uh, of us detecting one of these two conditions. And then the stop move would be uh, executed after the loop finished, and then the beep would occur. Um, what would happen if uh, the test center is not pressed and there wasn't a dark area? Uh, well, the robot's motors are continuing to run as this loop is going around and around. So the robot is moving across the field uh, and the sensors are continually monitoring. Uh, perhaps this uh, force sensor is connected to a lever arm that's gonna detect the two by four wall of the playing field. So it'll stop moving when it gets to the wall or uh, it'll find a black line and stop. And either way, uh, uh, you would hope eventually it would detect one of these and the motors would stop. If, it, if neither happens, this loop is just gonna keep going uh, until either the two and a half minutes are elapsed or the uh, team reaches out, grabs a robot and hits the uh, stop button on the robot. Any questions about this program? So let's talk about lists a bit. Uh, I'm not gonna do a thorough uh, exposition on lists, but lists are uh, a collection of storage locations arranged linearly. Um, so how might that be implemented inside the microprocessor? Uh, if the microprocessor knows where the beginning of the list is, it can take uh, the list index that you give it and uh, multiply by the uh, number of bytes of each element of the list and calculate uh, the storage location of, of the particular element. Uh, that's probably more detailed than you and your team needs, but uh, uh, the programming language is taking care of those details for you. And so you, you can have a list of numbers. Uh, an easy thing to think about that probably wouldn't come up uh, on the first Lego League uh, playing field, but uh, is easy to think about is, uh, let's say you, you had an additional sensor for your robot um, that measured temperature. And uh, over time was, uh, let's say every five minutes was uh, uh, making a temperature measurement. Each time it would pl uh, place that temperature in the list and then update a variable indicating uh, that next temperature is gonna go in the next element of the list. And then after a period of time, it decides it has enough temperature readings, perhaps eight hours worth of temperature readings. It could then have a loop that would go through that list, add up all those temperature readings into a, a, a rolling sum, a cumulative sum of the list, and then divide by the number of temperature readings to calculate the average. So uh, that's not realistic in, uh, in any robot challenge that I know of, but that's an example of how this can be used to collect data and then uh, process data to produce a result. Any questions about that?
here's some more list operators. Uh, the uh, there's the append, the delete. Uh, you can delete something from the list. You can delete all entries from the list. You can insert something in the list at a particular location. Uh, you can read a value from a list at a particular location. Um, and uh, you can determine whether a particular list element uh, has a particular value. Here's an example of a list program, uh, somewhat artificial, uh, where we're, uh, we're inserting various values into the list elements. Uh, uh, we're inserting a one into position one, a two into position two, a three into position three. Uh, then we're adding uh, a four to the list, which by implication be in the fourth position and uh, adding a five to the list. So, We've now got a list with, uh, of one, two, three, four, five. Uh, then we can replace uh, the second uh, item in that list where there was a two is now a 10. And we can insert uh, a 22 in the fourth position, which would make the previous fourth position, the fifth position, et cetera. Um, then we can uh, test uh, the, the list with an if statement and use that to affect uh, the robot moving. I'm not sure if this makes any sense. I haven't really studied this. It was provided to me by uh, a co-author of this presentation. Any questions about this uh, artificial example? So uh, here's a suggested thought problem or actual uh, thing that you could do, write a program to go straight ahead a number of inches that uh, you've previously saved in a variable. Um, and that's a pretty simple uh, statement. So now let's talk about subroutines. In Scratch, they're called my blocks because when you create them, they act like another block, but you created them from blocks that were already there. Why might we want to create subroutines, uh, sometimes called procedures? Well, we might have the same se sequence of code blocks in several places. And if we discover it's not working quite right in one place, we might fix it and forget to go and find all the other places that same sequence occurred and fix it there as well. By moving those common code blocks to a single place, uh, we can just go there and fix them. Same for making something better. It may work, but we may have an idea on making it more efficient or more reliable. We can go to the my block and change it once rather than going and finding all the places that sequence occurs, trying to make the same change exactly in each place. Another more subtle reason is as a program gets large, there's going to be so many blocks on the screen that it's hard for the human mind to keep them all in, in short term memory at the same time and understand how they relate to each other. By taking a complex program and breaking it into my blocks or subroutines, each of those subroutines might have seven or fewer blocks, something that's fairly easy for short term memory. And then they might be combined in a main program that refers to them. Perhaps that main program only has seven blocks as well. So each part can be understandable and maintained and enhanced and explained with comments and uh, used by more than one team member without a lot of problem. And then perhaps the most minor issue is that if you have a lot of blocks and you download them into the hub, that takes up memory on the hub. If you put the common blocks into a my block, then you're only downloading those particular blocks once and you're saving a little space, some memory space on the hub. So this slide says the same thing, different words. Uh, whatever you find using the same sequence of blocks in many places in your program, you might have uh, a program that needs to find a black line and then turn in a particular direction. It needs to do that more than once. 
Well, you can put those blocks in a my block, and we'll see what I mean by that in a minute. And then refer to that my block rather than replicating the same sequence over and over again. So I'm not sure this would come up on the competition field, but it's something kind of fun to think about. What if you wanted the robot to drive in the square? Well, uh, you could have it uh, set the uh, motors that it's going to be using, both to 50% speed, and then say go straight for 10 centimeters, then turn right for a half a rotation, perhaps a half a rotation is approximately a, a 90 degree right turn. If it's not, we might have to adjust that later. Um, then go straight again, 10 centimeters, and then turn right again, 10 centimeters forward, turn right again, 10 centimeters forward, turn right again. And that's fine, but it's a lot of blocks. And if we decide that it's really 0.45 that makes a nice right turn, 0.45 rotations, uh, then we have to change it in four places. So if we decide to control that turn uh, by degrees, let's say we want the axle to turn 160 degrees, we need to change it to degrees in four places, and uh, the number of degrees needs to be set in four places. So what can we do about that? We can define my block. We go to the section in the menus for my blocks, if you don't have any yet, all you'll see is the word my blocks and uh, followed by the phrase make a block. And here I've circled it because that's what you'd click on and it would give you this screen. And it would prompt you that you need to give your block a name. So you type that name in here. Let's call it move and turn. Uh, after we've done that, we click on save and it puts us, new block that we've just created under the my blocks menu so we've now got a new block that didn't exist before but we haven't finished it also puts a defined block on the screen uh, with the same name to remind us that we've got to uh, say how we're going to implement that so we need to select blocks from the other menus and again we're going to need to go straight for 10 centimeters and we think that maybe a half a rotation will be a nice turn in place to the right for about 90 degrees. So what do we have now? Uh, we don't have the whole square, but we have one side of the square plus a turn. Uh, we can now uh, uh, start our main program with the same two initialization blocks of setting the motors to A and B and 50% speed. And then we can fill it in by dragging one of our new blocks down called move and turn and do that a total of four times. Now our square is implemented by four move and turns. If we decide later that we wanna change it to 0.45 or 160 degrees, we change it in one place. We decide we want the side of the square to be seven centimeters or 15 centimeters. We don't have to change it in four places, we change it in one place. So let's look at a slightly more complicated uh, example. We'll start with a fresh my block. Um, we'll call it go straight, and we'll we'll see that that's a, a white lie where it's actually be, going to be a bit more complicated than that. But we want to tell the block what the distance is, so we can change it. Rather than changing the subroutine, we can change it when we use that my block. So we add an input. The input in computer science is also referred to as a parameter. So we create an input and we type in the name of that parameter is going to be distance because that's what we're gonna use it for. We could have also, uh, instead of providing a number, we could have provided a text string or a true false value by uh, clicking one of these icons. Well, we could say we're done, but we really haven't explained our, uh, this block very well. So we're gonna add more text to it and that's called add a label. Um, so it gives us another box to the right of the parameter and we type in CM for centimeters and the words and turn right. So now this is a, a self-describing, self-documenting, not completely, but close, my block. 
that's uh, read from left to right is go straight a certain distance uh, in centimeters and then turn right. We click on save and it puts this uh, my block in the menu on the left and also gives us the define block. And now we have to implement it. Uh, so let's focus on that. Again, we want it to go straight, but we fill in the distance, not with a fixed number, but with the parameter. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and leave the number of rotations a fixed amount of 0.5, and the homework, I think, uh, will suggest that you make this more flexible as well. So now we've defined that, uh, we fill in our main program with four calls to that, but each of those four calls uh, specifies the side, uh, the size or the length of that side of the rectangle. If we want to make a change uh, and make the square larger, well, now we do change it in four places instead of one. We can make it 12 or seven, but let's say we don't want a square. We want a rectangle. We could change it to 10, 5, 10, 5. And if we want to fine tune uh, the direction, we change it in one place or the number of rotations in one place. Later, we may uh, learn about the gyro and we can go and replace uh, two of the blocks uh, with several blocks. And this is a bit more complicated, but uh, it sets the yaw angle to zero and uh, tells it to go straight the same uh, distance but now we use the gyro to control the turn so that it will stop after 89 degrees. And what's greater than 89 degrees? 90. So it will turn uh, sharp right or turn in place until the gyro sensor detects that it's gone 90 degrees and then it'll stop moving. The calling routines remain the same. We call go straight 10 centimeters and turn right four times. And again, if we prefer that to be a rectangle, we can change it to 12, 6, 12, 6, or whatever dimensions we want. And each of those turns will be controlled by the gyro. And if we come up with an even better way later, we can change it. Or if we decide we want left turns for our square, we can change it, change it in one place to left 100. Or if we want a soft turn, a curved uh, sides of each rectangle, we can make it a less sharp turn. And again, change it in one place. So this is a bit stylistic, exactly how many parameters you want and how much how flexible you want the mind block to be uh, that you can leave up to your team members as uh, they develop preferences, their program grows in complexity, and uh, they grow in their understanding how to use mind blocks. And if that's not somewhat complicated, my blocks can call my blocks because once you've created a mind block, it can be used in any place, including in another my block. So what do we do here? Um, we created a my block that does the initialization work. Um, and we call it once because we want 50% speed and uh, the wheel size is 17 and a half. And we tell it uh, to create a square of 10 centimeters on the side. Uh, we haven't said how we did that yet. And then we change the speed to 25%. Wheels haven't changed, still 17 and a half. And then we have it do another square, a smaller one, five centimeters. So how does it implement that? Well, that initialization code is here where it takes the speed and plugs it into the movement speed block and takes the circumference that we provided it and plugs it into the one motor rotation is how many centimeters block. And then twice it calls the drive in a square block. This is brand new. We didn't have that before. The drive in a square block calls go straight a certain length centimeters and turn right four times. Uh, so where did it get that length? It got it from the parameter. So here, here the 10 centimeters be, uh, was filled, in, became the value of length and that was used four times. And then each time it provided that length value as the distance parameter of the my block we worked on before. This is the same improved version that uses the gyro. And that uh, distance value, which we know is the length we provided, which we know is 10, gets passed down 
and used in the move straight block. So we've got a my block calling a my block. That my block calls this my block four times to make a square. The second time the square block is called, driving a square block, it's given uh, five as its uh, number of centimeters. That's the value of length. That value of length is passed four times to the go straight and turn right block. And that uh, value of length becomes the distance for the move straight. I probably lied you, but uh, with some practice, you'll get used to that and see the power and you'll be able to help your team members see the power of using my blocks. So let's review. My blocks have names. Uh, they can have short names, or if they have parameters, you may find yourself adding the rest of the name to the right of one or more of the parameters. Um, you can give them data, uh, which behave like variables, but you don't de declare them separately as variables. That's why I prefer to call them parameters. Uh, you don't go to the variables uh, menu and create a variable. Uh, they're created implicitly when you define the my block. Those parameters can be numbers, text, or Boolean values, Boolean being the computer science word for true false. Uh, you can add the labels to further describe the block and its parameters. Um, once you've created a my block, they can be used like a built-in block that came with the software. Uh, and one my block can call another my block. So the homework part one is to create a triangle. To do that, create a my block that implements one side of the triangle plus one of the turns. Have the my block take two par parameters, a distance in centimeters, and a turn angle in degrees. Call the new my block three times to move the robot in the triangle by giving it side distances of five, ten, and five centimeters, and exterior angles of 130 degrees, 100 degrees, and 130 degrees. You notice that's different than the interior angle. Uh, this interior angle might be eighty degrees. Uh, but to implement that, the robot has to turn 130 degrees. So to repeat that, the first time it would be given five centimeters and 130 degrees. The second time the my block is called to be given 10 centimeters and 100 degrees. And the third time, again, five centimeters and 130 degrees. Once you've implemented that, did it turn out to be a triangle with this shape or something a bit different? Do the numbers need to be adjusted to get the results you want? Homework part two is to drive in trapezoid. But to test your understanding of lists, create two lists, one that contains six distances and one that contains six angles. And then use a repeat loop to call the my block six times, giving it the 30 and the 90 by grabbing the first element of the distance and the first element of the angle, and then calling again 30 and 45, after calling it six times, you may get something that's approximately a, this shape, a trapezoidal shape. If not, you may need to adjust the distances until you get the shape you're looking for. So let's take a look in the actual software. I'm not gonna construct things uh, all the way, but I wanna show you that if we want to create a my block, we select from the red or hot pink. I'm not sure which that is. We click click on make a block, and it asks us to fill in a name. And we haven't thought what we want this to do yet, so we'll just call it new block until we decide. And now we have a lock with that name. If we want to add a numeric parameter. We click once on add an input. We need to give that a name. It, it can be number or text, but that's not a name. We need to fill the name in. So uh, 
first value, I'll call it, because I haven't decided what it's going to do yet. And then let's say I want to pass a true false value. I click on that once. Um, I'll call that one now. Uh, and it makes it a trapezoid because that's the scratch symbol for true false value. And now will uh, be either true or false. And so maybe this my block will do something now if we set it to true and do it later if it's false. Uh, we haven't figured that part out yet. And if we wanted to further describe it, we can click on add a label. And we can say more about this. Again, we'll have to decide uh, what this block is going to do. Now, if we want that label to be in between the two parameters to help us define this parameters uh, units, for instance, um, we would need to do things in a different order. We would need to click on add a label before we added the second input because Scratch doesn't give you a way to insert a label in between things. It always adds it at the end. So you have to keep in mind um, doing that in the right sequence. So now we say save. It puts that in the menu under my blocks and gives us our define block. And we can now go to any other menu and start dragging blocks and plugging them in. We assume that somewhere along the line, we want to use these values. So we didn't decide before, but let's say the first value is going to be the number of centimeters to put that in place of the 10 so that it's not a fixed 10, but the amount provided when the buy block is used, we just drag that here. Um, if we want to use this true false value, we might use that in an if statement, so we could drag an if statement. We could create a condition right here, but we might just use whatever the true false value is that's passed in. So we drop that in, and if that parameter is true, uh, the blocks in this if statement will be executed. Otherwise, it'll go on to whatever we add next. Well, that's obviously uh, not a complete program. We haven't even decided what we wanted to do, but. That shows you mechanics visually that we talked about on the slides earlier. Let me briefly talk about display and sounds. Both the EB3 uh, and uh, the Spike Prime have capability for displaying things on the top of the hub brick uh, or, uh, or uh, producing sounds. That can be entertaining for the kids uh, and you can keep their interest up by showing them the, uh, these features, but these have a very practical uh, uh, use as well, but it's rather subtle. When a program gets more than a few blocks long, it's sometimes hard to know what part of the program is executing when something goes wrong. And the team will assume that it was uh, executing a particular series of blocks start changing their blocks and things get worse. Uh, and it may turn out that uh, the misbehavior of the program is in a completely different part of the program than they thought it was. So to help them uh, narrow down what part of the program is executing and what program uh, part of the program is misbehaving, they can add additional blocks to the program where it displays a pattern or number on the brick uh, to indicate where it is in the program or uh, produces a sound that's unique for that particular part of the program. Uh, that might also be useful on the playing field during the two and a half minutes um, uh, because they may be able to see uh, what the robot is doing by its display, particularly Spike Prime, which has a large display, or uh, if it's not too noisy, they might be able to hear the sound it's producing. But more likely, this, these features would be used um, in a quieter area where uh, the, uh, they're developing programs or perhaps in the practice area at an event um, to understand what the program is doing when it's uh, doing it right and when it's doing it wrong. Um, the, a slightly fancy word for adding display and adding sounds to a program is scaffolding. Adding scaffolding to the program gives you a, uh, intellectual insight into what the program is doing and helps you debug it. And it's also fun. So with that motivation, um, in Spike Prime, 
Um, you can control the brightness of the, uh, pic the large pixels on the display. Um, you can turn the display on for a, a particular amount of time, or you can turn it on and it'll stay on until you tell it to turn off. You can produce any pattern you want. Uh, it's a five by five display. Uh, this particular block and the one before it uh, has a drop down menu and you click and, and create your own pattern. It can be a smiley face, it can be a letter T uh, or number. There's another block for actually displaying numbers more explicitly. EV3 is uh, quite different um, because it's got a much higher resolution screen, although much harder to see from a distance because it's uh, a very low uh, contrast LCD screen. Um, but it, uh, the uh, EV3 Classroom comes with a whole bunch of emoticons that you can choose from um, at, from a drop down menu. Uh, here's some examples from Spike Prime. Uh, you, you can tell it, uh, tell the display to display a series of letters by using the, the display write command and giving it, in this case, five letters and it'll display one at a time scrolling across the surface of the LED screen because uh, five by five isn't big enough to show the whole word. Uh, there's another block for turning off all the pixels um, after you've turned them on. Um, you can also uh, control uh, the color of the button light. Uh, there's a convention on the Spike Prime, I believe, when the robot stopped, it's uh, red, and when the robot's running, it's green. Uh, but you can actually change that in the program, and that's another way of scaffolding the program is to change the color of the display light in different sections of the program so that the team gets feedback about where in the program is, is being executed. You can also control the lights on the ultrasonic sensor um, and uh, you can select uh, the half ring lights on that ultrasonic sensor with a drop down menu. EB3 Classroom, uh, some analogous display, but the details are all different because the display on the EV3 uh, on the EV3 brick is so different. It's a high resolution LCD screen instead of a low res large LCD screen. Sounds we talked about the reason for them. Uh, with Spike Prime, uh, it comes with a cat meow, and then you can record additional sounds. Uh, and it has a brick for uh, uh, stopping the sounds. Uh, for some reason, EV3 comes uh, pre-programmed uh, with a whole bunch of sounds, um, dogs and cats and insects, et cetera, that uh, you choose from the drop-down menu. Um, in Spike Prime, you can control the volume and pitch of a tone um, uh, using certain blocks. And with EV3, you have a variety of control of the sounds that the robot makes. <coughs> So here's an example of a um, arbitrary program, change the pitch uh, effect uh, by um, 10, set the pitch to 100, uh, play a beep of uh, pitch 60 for two tenths of a second, start playing a beep uh, at pitch 60, clear all the sounds uh, effects, stop all sounds. So a variety of way of piecing together tone sounds instead of uh, making it uh, meow like a dog or, or bark like a, excuse me, meow like a cat or bark like a dog. So here's a homework assignment that you'll find in your PDF file for uh, things you and the kids could do to uh, learn more about the display and uh, the s sound programming, depending on which uh, set they're using. 